Today, there's a new railway line along part of the ancient Silk Road. It's called the Nanjiang Railway. It runs for about 476 kilometers, or 300 miles, between Turfan in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region to the town of Korla, through the Gobi Desert, past the Tian Shan Mountains, and straight across the Taklamakan Desert. Turfan Station is one terminus of the Nanjiang Railway, and it's also a junction with a main line from Peking to Urumqi, the capital of Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Our journey began here in Turfan, an oasis city on the Silk Road with a long history. <laughs> Loaded a microbus and a jeep onto the freight cars so we could make side trips and use our cameras at a distance from the railway line. We also loaded some camels onto the train because on the part of the Silk Road that lies across the Tian Shan Mountains, there are still some places which you can only visit on horseback or by camel. As of 1980, only one small section of the Nanjiang Railway was being used as yet, so the Chinese government provided a special train for the expedition. It had three freight cars, three passenger coaches, and a dining car. As soon as we'd left Tour de Fine, we were in the Gobi Desert, which extends as far as you can see. The train passes through the desert on the way to the Tian Shan Mountains, which rise to peaks of more than 4,000 meters, or 12,000 feet. We were now climbing steadily, and it was hard work for the engine driver. It was the first time the camels had ever travelled by train, and it seemed very different to them from walking the sands of the desert. The Nanjing Railway was started in 1976, and 70,000 people were involved in building it. They only finished laying the track at the end of 1979. The railway builders included members of the People's Liberation Army Railway Corps and civilians. And the building of the line was a sort of joint civilian army project.
About 140 kilometers or 100 miles and three hours after leaving Turfan, we came to Iargo station. The town of Iargo stands in the foothills of the Tian Shan Mountains. It's quite a new town, specially built in the wilderness for the construction of the railway. In one corner of the town lies an old signal tower, originally built about 1,300 years ago during the Tang Dynasty. It was made of rounded boulders and has been witness to the rise and fall of many different people since it was built. During the Tang Dynasty, soldiers were garrisoned here to protect the travellers passing through the mountains and to keep an eye on the people of the western lands, who often posed a threat to the power of the emperor. Here you can find many ancient forts like this one. The Chinese government ordered that the whole region should be carefully surveyed by archaeologists before the railway could be built. This is the Ara, a fertile valley which runs past Iargo deep into the Tian Shan Mountains. And many ancient grave mounds have been found here and excavated. We asked Mr. Wang, an archaeologist, about the grave mounds. Is this where the grave mounds were found? Yes, and that area over there too has many mounds. Some of them lie alongside the ditch. How were they built? Well, they were dug about two meters or six feet deep and lined with rough stones and then covered with planks and a mound of earth. They were tombs for the dead. What did you find inside, apart from the remains of the dead? Here's something I found during the excavation. Uh. You can still see the painted decoration. How old is it? It's from the period of the spring and autumn annals, about 2,500 years ago. This relief of a lion was excavated from one of the grave mounds. It's made of pure gold. These smaller pieces are also of pure gold, and they could be either lions or tigers. 
The archaeologists think that this is a belt clock. Similar objects have been found at sites of the same age in Iran and also in the tombs of the ancient Scythian people in the USSR. About 400 BC, the Tian Shan area was already a sort of cultural melting pot where exchanges were made between East and West. And it developed a unique mixed culture of its own. The main work of building the Nanjiang Railway was done by the PLA Railway Corps. As of 1980, the finishing touches were being put to every station on the line in preparation for regular operation. Here's a steam locomotive of a kind that's popular among railway buffs everywhere and which has been built in China since the 50s. It's called a construction locomotive. This is called a liberation locomotive, and it's of an old design, once used on the Manchurian Railway. Our engine driver was called Mr. Go Xianghu, and he's been working on liberation class locos for 18 years. Beyond Iargo, the railway is under army control. They were making tests all along the track to prepare for the opening. The expedition made its way by working on the test train schedule. The train runs along a track that was once a section of the Silk Road that led over the Tian Shan Mountains. There are two ways to Kola, and one goes through the wastes of the Taklamakan Desert. However, most travellers chose the mountain route, which was steeper, but where there was plenty of water and you could find food. The train's now approaching the foothills of the Tian Shan Mountains, and the way is steeper. This part of the line has an incline of 18 in a thousand, which means that for every thousand meters you go along, you rise 18 meters. It's the first tough section of the journey over the mountains, and we soon reach an altitude of 1,500 meters or 4,500 feet. It was quite different here from the fertile Ara Valley.
were no trees or grass, the scenery became much rougher, and the train passed through one tunnel after another. Because the rock breaks rather easily, it was very difficult to build these tunnels. There are 29 tunnels on the Nanjiang Railway, from 60 to 6,000 meters in length. That's 180 to 18,000 feet. There are also 36 viaducts and bridges. The steep sides of the valleys have been traversed by zigzags to avoid too great an incline. The Xie Argo tunnel was made to a special design circling inside the mountain, so the line emerges at a point 60 meters above the tunnel entrance, that's a hundred feet. Inside the line is very steep, and two locomotives are necessary to pull a long train through the tunnel. It was hard work for our locomotive, which puffed frantically to get through. Now we were out again, and you can see below the mouth of the tunnel we entered just a short while ago. In this way, the train gradually crosses the mountains. The special train for the expedition was a first-class Pullman type, called a Zhuangguo train. It had big compartments and was very comfortable. The kitchen, of course, was coal burning. The head chef, who was 69 years old, and two assistants worked hard to provide us with the best possible fare. After we'd finished the first course, we were surprised to find he'd prepared hamburgers for us. It was very thoughtful of him, as up to then we had nothing but Chinese food.
Now the altitude was 2,500 meters, 7,500 feet. But it was still only part of the way to the highest point. The huge locomotive was already straining at the steepness of the slope. The peaks of the Tianshan Mountains are more than 4,000 meters high, or 12,000 feet. So there's snow on them even in midsummer. It's the water from the melting of these eternal snows that feeds the oases at the foot of the mountain, and which made possible the prosperity of the ancient Silk Road. This area is a pasture land for nomadic tribesmen who welcomed us from horseback. Haddahat Viaduct, the longest on the entire line, is about 200 kilometers or 100 miles from Turfan, and is the halfway point on the railway. Here, the nomads have to bring everything they need by horse and camel from Turfan, a journey that takes them more than a week. By train, it had only taken us four hours. The new railway will be very important to these people. They call it the Happiness Railway. Standing in their pastures, the nomads greeted us as we looked at them from the train windows. They're of the Mongolia Torf tribe, and Mang Guangqiang is a descendant of the Torf kings. At the beginning of the 17th century, they lived north of the Tianshan Mountains on the Jungal Plains. Then, as the result of tribal fighting, they left that area and drifted as far away as the Volga River in Russia. But they were unable to forget their original home. And during the latter half of the 18th century, with great difficulty, they managed to find their way home. Man would have been the 48th king since the return. The great emperor Qian Long of the Qing dynasty was trying hard just at the time to bring all the Western lands tribes under Chinese control. So he was very pleased that the Torft had come back. He gave them five different pasture areas and eight silver seals. The seals are inscribed and they read to the loyal and brave king of the ancient Torf people. Words that hint at the many troubles in the tribe's history.
Today, the Torft still wonder the Tian Shan Mountains with their livestock, herd them with lassoes, and live in tents. They still show the pristine vigor of the nomadic peoples of the Silk Road. Now is the time to use the camels we had brought with us from Turfan. We decided to try to negotiate a steep mountain pass by camel to discover for ourselves the difficulties that ancient travelers had to traverse the mountains. Part of the road was very swampy, and the camels rocked violently back and forth as they struggled to keep their footing. Camels are very good in the desert, but they're not nearly so good on a mountain. And because we had to rest them every 15 minutes, our progress was very slow. After five hours, we had ascended to 3,500 meters, or 10,000 feet, and passed into a region of everlasting snow. At the edge of the snow field, the snow is always melting, so the ground is very wet and marshy. Every time a camel stumbled, we had to grab a hump to keep from falling off. We began to understand what a difficult journey it must have been for the Silk Road travellers. After seven hours, we finally reached the pass, which is at an altitude of 3,800 meters, 12,000 feet. The wind was freezing cold, and the white peaks of the Tian Shan Mountains, which must have seemed so threatening to the merchants of the Silk Road, seemed in front of our very faces. We were looking at a sight that must have impressed many travellers in the old days.
After we'd returned to the pastures, we boarded the train again. We were going to make the same trip again, but this time by railway. Because it's to go to the highest point on the Nanjiang Railway, the locomotive is checked with great care. The line passes through the Qixian Tunnel immediately under the pass it took us seven hours to cross by camel. The train made the trip in exactly 30 minutes. The tunnel is more than six kilometers long three miles, the longest tunnel on the railway. It's also the highest point and has an altitude of more than 3,000 meters, 10,000 feet. Digging the tunnel through the frozen ground and underneath the glacier was no easy task. The air temperature inside the tunnel is always below freezing even in midsummer. And the walls of the tunnel are always white with frost. As soon as we had emerged from the tunnel, we could see that the scenery had completely changed. Instead of the rocky mountains and snow-covered peaks, we saw a fertile valley spread out before us. It was the Ura Sultai Valley. This strip of green leads from the Tianshan Mountains to the Taklamakan Desert. On either side of the valley, steep slopes carry melting snow from the mountain to feed the river at the bottom, a river that flows all the way to the desert. As we descended into the valley, we came to a green marshy area called the Yenchi Plain, a fertile land with plenty of water from the melting snow on the mountains. The Nanjiang Railway was built in sections from the Turfan Terminus and this section had only been laid a short while before we arrived. Until they spread gravel under the sleepers, the train could only travel at about 10 kilometers an hour, at 6 miles an hour, no faster than a bicycle. Yenqi is a Silk Road oasis town with a very long history. We took the vehicles off the freight cars for the first time in eight days to take a trip across the plain.
This is the Kaidu River, which was once an icy torrent flowing down from the Tianshan Mountains. Now it's been controlled and flows gently through the plain. Xuan Zhang, a famous Chinese Buddhist priest who visited Yen Qi in the middle of the 7th century, described it in these words. The land is good for cultivating millets, barley, Chinese dates, grapes, western pears and Chinese pears. The climate is warm and the customs of the people are dignified. We went to take a look at an open-air market in the middle of the town and found it full of excellent fruit and vegetables. Yen Chi has a population of about 30,000 people, almost all from a small tribe called the Hui. Their ancestors were nomads from the plains of Mongolia and they're Muslims. But during the Tang Dynasty, when Xuanzang came here, it was a Buddhist city with 10 temples and more than 2,000 priests. We were told that you could still see Buddhist ruins on the outskirts of the city. They were talking about these, the Shikushin Thousand Buddha Caves. The ruins cover an area of about a square kilometre, but they've been so completely destroyed that it's hard to make them out at all. Even so, we could just discern traces of temples in 7th century style. We heard that the people who live here often collect objects from the ruins. We spoke to a man who had found something in the ruins. Did you find this here? Yes, right here. Uh, may I see it for a moment? What is it? I don't know. It looks like a tiny Buddhist image. Perhaps it's valuable. Oh, yes, I'm sure it's valuable. Where exactly did you find it? Just over here. Will you show me? Yes, of course. <laughs> Was it here? Yes, just there. These tiny images, many of which have been found near these caves, were portrait busts of the people who donated them.
On the morning of the 10th day since we'd left Turfan, the train puffed out of Yenchi and headed for Koila, the last station on the line. When we were there, it had been planned that the whole of the Nanjiang Railway would open for regular operation by the end of 1981, and there are plans to extend it one day to the town of Kashgar on the far western edge of the Taklamakan Desert. When the extension has been finished, the hard journey across the desert, today a toilsome trouble, will be nothing more than a pleasant train ride. The railway will make an important contribution to the development of the autonomous region and of the Taklamakan Desert, both of which used to be regarded as marginal areas. By the time we reached Kaula Station, the sun was far in the west, but an enthusiastic welcome awaited us from soldiers of the PLA. Our journey over the most difficult parts of the Tian Shan Mountains, the 476 kilometers or the 300 miles between Turfan and Kola, was finally over. It took us 10 days because we stopped many times on the way. But now the railway's working, it only takes eight hours. <laughs> Even the Silk Road is changing today. That was what was uppermost in our minds, as we said farewell to the Happiness Railway. Thank you. Thank you. 